It's uh, my pleasure to introduce our concluding speaker. I was listening to the last uh, session in the back, listening to my former student, Gordon Flake, um, wondering how, much, how in the world he got so much smarter than I did uh, over the last few years. Um, but it doesn't always happen, because I'm about to introduce one of my former professors, uh, who continues to be the uh, foundation of the Korean Studies program here on campus. Uh, Professor Mark Peterson and I first met, I think it was in the summer of 1983. Uh, Professor Peterson was the uh, Fulbright director in Korea, and I was on a study abroad living in the luxurious YMCA on Chongno Iga in downtown Seoul. And uh, Professor Peterson was one of our instructors, would visit and uh, teach, and I've known him for the last 25 years. He's the uh, section head here of Korean Studies on campus, continues to be the heart and soul of Korean Studies on campus, and has agreed to uh, deliver some concluding remarks today. So please join me in welcoming Professor Mark Peterson. <laughs> And Jeff, we're supposed to have some questions and answers too. Jeff, you want to, uh, that'll be fine. I, in fact, I'm more comfortable with that. I don't, I, I'm uncomfortable giving the concluding remarks as if that's the end of it. Uh, uh, but let me stir the pot a little bit and uh, suggest some ideas that uh, uh, maybe will stimulate some other discussion, other, other uh, questions from, from some of you. Uh, but as I begin, first and foremost, I want to say thanks to KEI for putting this together and to James Alvis and your crew uh, in Washington that worked so hard on this and all the emails that have gone back and forth to set this up. It's a great outreach program you've done. Uh, here at BYU, we've been the beneficiary of this KEI outreach at least four times that I can remember of different uh, 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 discussions like this. About every two years or so, we get on their radar screen and we're grateful to be on your radar screen and hope we do a good job and you put us back on your radar screen. We're, we're uh, grateful to have this kind of input here on our, on our campus. And uh, thanks to Gordon, uh, our great alumni who's uh, uh, doing a great job with the Mansfield uh, uh, Institute. And we're just happy to see you any time and every time you can come to uh, campus. We've had some great discussions over the years when you come back and bring your Beltway perspective. And I like to think we kind of help you out with the non-Beltway perspective. I mean, this is the way it really is out here, you know. I mean, uh, uh, the Beltway things go up and down real quickly, and, uh, and there's more consistency out here in the, in the hinterland, I think, and, uh, at least on a couple of points that I'll mention here in, the middle, in a minute. Uh, Jim Heller from State, thanks so much for coming out. I appreciate getting to know you and to uh, 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 hear your perspectives and, uh, and to see the great work you're doing in the State Department. I endorse what you just said about wanting more people to look at the Foreign Service. I hope some of you who are interested in the Foreign Service, maybe don't know what it is exactly, want to learn a little, little bit about it, take advantage of his offer to talk about it a little bit afterward. Uh, uh, the Foreign Service is a great career, and uh, uh, let me endorse your plug uh, for recruiting uh, more Foreign Service officers. We have a retired Foreign Service officer that was sitting in the back. He just had to leave a little while ago. But uh, uh, with our uh, uh, interest in world affairs and languages and such, I, I hope uh, more of you would be interested in the Foreign Service. And Abraham Kim, good to meet you. Uh, appreciate you coming out here from the Eraser Group and to hear about uh, uh, the work that you're doing. And I'm grateful we don't have to pay your consultant fees. <laughs> you all know that his presentation would be at least $1,000 an hour if you were in some other uh, situation. So we're grateful to have Abraham here volunteering to do this uh, uh, outreach thing through the KEI. So uh, thank you all four visitors for, uh, for joining with us. Um, so the, the title of the thing was Lee Young box uh, uh, election and uh, Korea turns to the right. And uh, a little bit about Lee myung Uh You know, I liked Kim Dae-jung. I liked No Mu Hyun. I've got a scroll of uh, uh, hand, hand calligraphy of, uh, of uh, uh, Kim Young sam hanging in my office. I like these opposition guys. But I like Lee myung -bak. Uh, I like this turn to the, to the right, if that's what it is. Uh, uh, I think he's going to be a great uh, 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 president for, for Korea. Now, you can call me an optimist if you want, and, and that's one of my characteristics. I remember uh, a few years ago, I met a friend who had lived with me in Korea many years ago, and he reminded me of a time where I joined a party late. It was a church group, so there were military people, business people, a diplomat, uh, embassy person, uh, several of these friends from church that were having a, a party on a, on a given night. And I was late because I had gone to the RAS meetings. The RAS is the Royal Asiatic Society, and it's this pro-Korean group where they get together and talk about Korean 
history or literature and they have a lecture twice a month and they go on tours and none of this group of business people and diplomats participate in RAS. But here's Mark Peterson going to the RAS thing first and then showing up at the party late. And as I walk in the door, I don't remember this, but my friend told me about it. He said, uh, he said as I walked in the door, they said, oh, okay, clean it up. Quit griping about Korea now. Mark Peterson's here. And uh, they, were, they saw their view of sitting around whining about this and that and the other. And then I was always positive. You know, Korea's a great place to live, I was always telling them. Well, I think Lee myung is going to be a great president. Now, we've seen a lot of problems with what he's proposed. The 747, there's no way it's going to happen. But imagine the inspiration that he brings to people just to put that out there. I mean, the three, 386 numbers that you mentioned was a number that worked in Korea. Yeah, we're the 30-ish people who were educated in the 80s, who were born in the 60s. We're the people that are running the show during that time uh, a few years ago. Well, the 747 it sort of clicks. And even if it doesn't turn out to be 747, it turns out to be 647. And the 7 at the end is not going to work. Even if it's going to be 5 30, 13, it, it's still a, an inspiration to the people. And I think that that's one thing that Im Young Bak brings to the, 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 the table. More than anything else, when I go to Korea, I just got back uh, a week ago from a trip over there. Uh, when I go to Korea, I look at the Chung Chan. And the Chung Chan was an incredible thing. He's opened up this park that runs five kilometers long right through the center of the city. And you can go there and walk down the stairs and walk along that stream and it's an artificial stream. They pump water out of the Han River, so they have a steady flow there, and so it doesn't have highs and lows and, and a natural flow, but it has, a, it has a, a flow of water that runs down, and it's got these stepping stones. You can step across. You saw the picture of him sitting on one of those stepping stones with his feet down in the water. It's an incredible thing. Now, I was in Korea the first time when they put the cover over the Chungaechan. I remember them building the, the lower cement covering for the lower road, to cover up that rotten, awful sewer, because they didn't have a good sewer system back in, in Korea in those days, and people just dumped their things into the streams. That was the main stream in the center of Seoul and would empty out into the Han. And uh, people would dump their garbage in. It was an awful, smelly thing. And uh, I remember them covering it over. That was a great thing. We're going to cover over this sewer. It's modern. And then they put the elevated highway on top of that. An elevated highway in downtown Seoul. Oh my goodness, that was huge progress back in those days. And now here comes Lee myung uh 30 years later, and says, nah, let's tear it all down. And we'll put a stream running through here and plant trees and bushes, and <laughs> we'll have a whole new thing. And people thought he was not so. But he did it. And it's the most beautiful thing in downtown Seoul now. You go down there, and you go down the stairs and walk along the side of that stream, and you forget you're in downtown Seoul. You think you're out in the countryside somewhere. And you walk along and you can't see the buildings to the side of you for a while there. And then all of a sudden you come along where there's some tall buildings. And you look and think, oh yeah, oh yeah, we're in Seoul. We're in downtown Seoul. So uh, that inspires me. And I think it inspires a lot of Koreans. And when he talks about building this Grand Canal, now on this last trip over there, people were saying the Grand Canal is wacko. Well, it ain't gonna happen. Uh, but I wonder if a visionary like him, <laughs> if he's determined to do it, he, he says he's backing off on it now, he's getting surveys and people are saying it's nuts and all this, but he might just decide to do it. And it might just turn out to be an inspirational thing. Um, and it's not gonna get you to poos on fast, but getting to poos on fast is not the most important thing in the world. Uh, to get to poos on cheap and to travel along, and have these locks, and he sees putting pleasure boats out there where you can, uh, like going out to the East Coast and renting a condo for a week, why not go out and rent a, a stateroom on a ship for a week and float through Korea and stop and see this and that along the way? Incredible idea. Nobody would have thought of this, you know, several years ago. For, but for Lee myung Bak to do this, more power to him. Now, one of the slides you had on here, uh, 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 James, you had on there, uh, uh, the headline that people were holding their paper said, No Mu Hyun impeached. And it reminded me of the trouble that No Mu Hyun had when he first became president. He was impeached. He wasn't found guilty. He was found innocent from the impeachment and released and able to go back and be president again. But he, removed, he was removed from office for a time. Which reminds me that uh, Korean, Koreans are pretty rough on their presidents. The first few months of the first year or two of No Mu Hyun's administration was pretty rough. That's when he got impeached. And the backlash, the anti-Emyung Bak thing is likely to be 
Similarly severe, he won't be impeached, but uh, the corruption issue is probably going to raise its ugly head, and he's going to have some things to get through. But uh, he's a tough guy. He's the bulldozer. He's probably going to plow right through it and build his canal and do whatever he wants to do. But uh, Koreans are pretty rough on their uh, presidents. I used to say that Koreans cannibalize their presidents. Uh, as soon as a guy gets out of office, they kick him around, arrest him. Chun Doo Hwan and No Mu Hyun were, uh, uh, No Tae were arrested and found guilty and given a death sentence and a life sentence. And, and, and now they're out. They're former statesmen. But uh, uh, the up and down of how you treat the presidents is pretty rough. But I think he'll survive that. Um, the uh, uh, he, he, it's interesting how he he was able to capture Park Chung Hee from Park Chung Hee's daughter. You see, uh, you saw the comparison. He had those great slides of the comparison of Park Chung Hee, and a lot of people are wishing for a revival of Park Chung Hee, the good old days. Now, I lived through the good old days, and they weren't that good <laughs> in Korea, uh, but in a lot of ways they were, and people are nostalgic for the booming economy thing, and uh, so. Some time ago, if you take a presidential poll uh, of who's going to be the next president, people were saying Park Geun-hye, Park Chung-hee's daughter. She was indeed the, the embodiment of Park Chung-hee. If anybody could revive Park Chung-hee in the good old days, it's his daughter. Well, Im young bak stole that from her. He out Park Chung-hee'd <laughs> Lee Geun-hye and stole the office from, from the man's own, own daughter. Uh, so he's got some incredible capabilities that I, I think will bode well for the, for the future in, in Korea. Uh, his North Korean policy, uh, you know, it's, it's problematic now, and he brings up the human rights issue, which was a taboo, taboo under the Nomu Hyun and the, and the Kim Dae-jung administration. But I think somehow he's going to pull this off, too, because he's handing out a heck of a big carrot. And he's using a little bit of a stick. And I think that's going to work in North Korea. I made my first trip to North Korea. You'd be proud of me, Gordon. Uh, two weeks ago, went to Kaesong, just on the Kaesong day trip. And uh, North Korea is just, oh, it just takes your breath away. It's so oppressive. And so I, I said at lunch that my, if I was asked what my impression was, the first three words to describe North Korea, I'd say, well, it's drab, drab, and drab. It's just overwhelmingly drab. <laughs> Uh, and poor, oh my goodness, but uh, uh, if No Mu Hyun is talking about doing things with North Korea to help raise their standard of living, I think that might just be a clever key to work toward what Abraham might be a soft fall. I, I, I fear that what you say is true, that it, it'll be, that the fall will be catastrophic, but I'm, I'm hopeful that many of South Koreans, when they talk about a soft landing, that somehow they can work that out through these negotiations and little by little, uh, people, uh, people who are critics of, of Kim Dae-jung like to criticize the, uh, the sunshine policy. And the American right wing likes to criticize the sunshine policy and say that basically it was a, a failure and all of that. But I don't think so. You look at the North Korean, you look at the sunshine policy. Before the sunshine policy, there was absolutely no, no communication with North Korea. Any trade with North Korea would get you in jail. Now, since the sunshine policy, North Korea's largest trading partner, larger than even China, is South Korea. Trade is, is, is uh, uh, going back and forth between North and South Korea, and all sorts of little things are going on. The uh, Diamond Mountain tours have been a huge success. They started to taper off a little bit, so they've opened up the Kesung tours. And for $180, 45 people, times 14 busloads every day go to North Korea. This, someone added it up and it's uh, in the millions of dollars they're making off this Kesung tour. And the guides on the Kesung tour are saying the next thing is going to be uh, Pektusan tours. And they're, gonna, they're building an airport up in North Korea, North, North, North Korea, so people can fly up into North Korea uh, and go hike Pektusan. And North Korea will make the money. Who's making the money now? The Chinese. <laughs> if you want to go to Pektusan, you've got to pay big bucks to go up into China and climb Pektusan from the, from the China side. And so North Korea is talking about doing this. And little by little, things are happening where uh, there's some openings. And I'm optimistic that these openings, here's the optimist again, uh, little by little will lead to some sort of accommodation where we don't have this uh, uh, drastic fall and a, and a huge 
uh, human uh, catastrophe and suffering that would be involved in a, uh, in a cat catastrophic fall. And maybe E. Myung-Bak has the right idea in this thing. Um, this is not apropos of anything I can link in, but it's a great story, so I'm going to tell it. Uh, someone talked about the economy, the North Korean economy not having enough people. And in the economy, you have to bring in now uh, third country laborers to do the 3D work, the dirty, dangerous, and, and difficult work, uh, because there aren't enough people to do the work. Uh, there aren't enough younger people. One of my favorite people in Korea was a young man who joined the Mormon church uh, when I was over there as a mission president. And uh, he was just excited about the church. He just loved it. And he was a member of the church for a year, and after a year you can qualify to become a missionary yourself. And this kid quit school as a Jeju University to go out and be a missionary. Then he came back and he married a return missionary sister, and uh, they decided they were going to obey the laws of the church without any equivocation, which meant having lots of kids. Now you guys snicker because in the, in the Mormon church you're supposed to have lots of kids. We're like the Catholics, we're kind of, you know, Lots of kids. And, uh, and yet most Mormons kind of, well, you're supposed to have as many kids as you can handle. You know, well, we can handle three, you know. Uh, we can handle four. And, you know, there are a lot of people that equivocate about this. This young guy that I'm talking about, he and his wife decided they were going to have as many kids as they could. And they had seven in a row, just like that. And I haven't been in touch with them for a couple of years. They probably had their eighth by now. But uh, seven kids in Korea, where one and two is the norm, was incredible. And when they had number three, they were warned by the public officials that uh, uh, this child will not get uh, school privilege. Because Korean policy is two children. You have a third, uh, you have to pay for school, no, no free school. And the fourth, there's even more penalties that you have to pay extra for these the extra children. This couple said, you're not telling us what to do. We're going to have kids. And they did, and they struggled by They didn't make a lot of money, but they did. They've got these seven kids. Now what's happened? Korea needs kids. The newspaper has found this family with seven kids and has done feature page, uh, full page stories on this family with seven kids. And instead of being the pariah who are eating up all of the food and stuff for everybody else, making everybody starve in the world, that they were when they had number three and number four. Now with number seven, the society has changed so much that they're heroes. And they're great nationalists. <laughs> and they're providing labor and the workforce for our, for our people. Uh, so that doesn't have much to do with anything except when you're talking in economics about running out of people. There's one family out there that's doing their part, at least. Uh, Gordon, when you were here last, you were all concerned about the death of the, of the Korean-American alliance. And that's what we were talking about. And you were saying, this is unthinkable, but now we're talking about the death. And today you said that if we had voted, if Congress had voted at that point, that the alliance would have been dead. But now the buzzword is the maturity of the Korean-American alliance. It's no longer dead, but it's maturing and going on into a new world. This is what I mean by the Beltway cycle of things. You've got to come out of hinterland where things don't move so fast. And, you know, we, we don't get so upset about these things. Uh, I am concerned about the death of the FTA. And I agree with you, Jim. I, I, I think that's a, a terrible a disaster. And, and uh, Gordon, I think you're dead on that Ohio has really killed Korea. This, this fighting for the bottom, as you have put it, among the Democratic candidates, to, that NAFTA is no good and any other free trade agreement is no good. Colombia has, has ruined things. Hillary had to fire her, her, her guy because he was out talking to the Colombians, which doesn't bode well for Korea. But hopefully somewhere in the long run, uh, the sensible things that you were talking about in the State Department, if the State Department and others can go to work on Obama, Obama's trade man or whoever is out there that you can work on to, to get this uh, through, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be set back for a while. But hopefully it's not the death of FTA like the death of the alliance. The, the, the alliance will survive and will go on. Um, Im Young Bak, then, I think he's going to look better and better uh, compared to No Mu Hyun. Poor No Mu Hyun, the guy's snake bitten. Uh, your insights, Gordon, on, on what he did, I think, was really good. That he said all the wrong things, but he did all the right things. And we've got all these hard things lined up now so that uh, uh, we don't have to worry about uh, 
uh, Imam Bach doesn't have to worry about those. And, and, and uh, I, I just can't get over some of the images I have of Nomo Hyun. Remember him down in Singapore with, uh, with Bush? And Nomo Hyun, more than anything else, wanted to have his treaty ratified. He signed a treaty to sign the treaty, right, with Kim Jong-il. And it was of no force because you have to have the Americans, the Chinese, and the UN, and everybody else involved to end the war because they were all parties to the war. But the North Koreans and the South Koreans have signed a treaty to end, to end the war. To, to, they signed a treaty to sign the treaty. And uh, they consider this a great step forward. And Nomu Hyun wanted some recognition of this from George Bush. So he, he, <laughs> he sideswipes him at that, that press conference. And he's saying things like, you've agreed that we'll sign the treaty, right? And George Bush goes, no, we're talking nuclear disarmament. That's all he would talk about. He wouldn't talk about the, uh, the treaty. And Nomu Hyun tried three times. And Bush became more and more irritated each time that he was trying to, to derail uh, uh, the, the Bush policy in, in, uh, in, in Korea. But uh, I'm optimistic that uh, Im Young Bak will not be snake bitten like No Mu Hyun. And certainly, uh, he's got a better relationship with Washington already. I, I don't know exactly how it works in the White House, but I imagine that. George Bush was getting a, given a one-page briefing on No Mu Hyun. You know, who is this guy? Who's the president of South Korea? Well, here it is right here. And you read, if you read a one-page briefing on No Mu Hyun, and you're about to meet him, it doesn't look very good. You know, labor lawyer, anti-American campaigner, uh, uh, ran on an anti-American policy. No wonder the guy didn't get Camp David. You know, he was lucky to get the, uh, <laughs> the back porch of the White House, you know. He's not getting Crawford. He's not getting Camp David. He didn't get anything. So at least with uh, Nomo Hyun starting off at Camp David, that, that's, that's, uh, that's huge to show uh, 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 possibilities there. And uh, one other image I want to uh, look at to finish, and that's the, North, uh, or the New York Symphony in, uh, in Pyongyang. You're right, that was absolutely huge, to be playing the Star Spangled Banner and all of that. Uh, one thing I learned in my trip to Kesong that's probably more important than anything else I saw, was I went into the one little shop where they sell junk, and they had postage stamps. North Korea doesn't have good stuff. There isn't much stuff to buy. You go there for a, as a tourist, and you want to buy some souvenirs, and there isn't much stuff. But they have good stamps. They have really good stamps. And several of the stamps were commemorating 615, June 15th. Uh, and uh, that's a huge holiday in North Korea. You talk to a South Korean group and say, hey, what's 615? And they don't know what you're talking about. Nothing happened on 615. But what did? That was the day that Kim Dae-jung went to North Korea. And they talk about 615 being the unification, the day of the start of the unification. And part of that process, and it's a process, and it takes time, is the New York Symphony going over there. And if we can only build on those positive things. Uh, Don Gregg is one of my great heroes. And I know the, uh, the Bush administration hates his guts, but he's a guy that's out there doing the work. He was instrumental in lining up the New York Symphony. He was instrumental in setting up a North Korean exchange of uh, scholars with Kim Chek University and Syracuse University. And he's out there doing the work. And it's the ki that kind of thing that's eventually going to lead to some sort of uh, uh, peaceful uh, reunification and understanding between both North Korea and South Korea and North Korea and the United States. And there's my optimistic pitch. Thank you very much.